You know, when I searched the internet for the blockbuster entertainment and unrivaled intellectual stimulation that is the Tom Gully Show, believe me, it can be a mixed bag when you begin approaching potential guests. Well, in this case, I hit the jackpot with Gretchen Martins. She will impress you with her knowledge. She will win your respect with her practical, well-thought-out viewpoints. She will enthrall you with her eloquence, and she will make me sound like a cast member from Hee Haw with her incredible speaking voice. So now I'll shut up, and you can hear from Gretchen Martins, gun culture expert. Gretchen Martins is an expert on gun culture, specializing on returning veterans. She founded and runs Homeward Deployed, an organization that assists service members returning home from active service. She's also the author of Untying the Yellow Ribbon, Why Saying Thank You for Your Service Isn't Enough. She's here today to talk to us about the topic of the moment, which is, of course, the current climate of gun culture and gun violence in our society. And uh, Gretchen, thank you so much for being here. Oh, I'm excited to be here, Tom. I'm glad because you're currently out out touring and talking to people about a variety of subjects and you are in the gun capital of the universe, Texas, and and you're in the, in a particularly uh <laughs> gun-ridden gun-loving place, Tyler, Texas, in East Texas. So, you're in the right spot to talk about this today. Okay, I'll take your word from that because I believe you told me you were from Texas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, recently it seems the incidences of gun violence, and, and we can talk about that later, the fact that it seems that way. It may not actually be that way. Uh, not just random, you know, act of passion, person on person, robbing a liquor store gun violence, but specific body count kind of gun violence has been on the rise. Why do you think that young white males predominantly are, are now engaging in this horrific activity? I don't know that there's one specific reason that, that explains all of this gun violence, but I think that there is a pattern behind. I mean, we, I think we need to look at why is it young white males? I think that a part of that obviously is easy access to assault weapons. I just read a story about a knife attack in China where 22 school children were injured, but nobody was killed because it's much harder to kill large numbers of people with a knife or with a I get, uh, uh, just a regular handgun that doesn't rapid fire. I think we're also seeing some increases in mental health issues, in um, conduct disorders among our young people. And we're not so good at treating mental health issues in our society and, and dealing with them effectively. Well, it seems like after a tragedy like the one in Newtown, the talk immediately goes to gun control. Uh, as opposed to some of the other things you mentioned. Where do you stand on gun control? I think it's a part of the answer. I think that there are multiple things that we can do. I think gun control is a place to start, but I think it has to, this is my personally held opinion, it has to be done balancing Second Amendment rights. So I think that people do have a right. I personally don't own guns, nor do I imagine that I ever will. But I think that other people have the right to choose to own guns and have them in their home. But I think when you look at assault weapons, when you look at high capacity magazines and body shattering bullets, those are things that regular civilians probably don't need. I'm also not a hunter, but I do know people that hunt and nobody hunts with assault weapons. So I think that there are some things like that like eliminating the loopholes in background checks, the so-called gun show loopholes, perhaps mandatory waiting periods, um, mandatory training. Uh, people have brought up when you, you learn to drive, you have to get a driver's license. Why is it that any person can go and buy a gun and not know how to use it safely? So I think that's just a start. Mm -hmm. I, I'm kind of on the fence, like I guess most people are. I've, I've got family and, of course, uh, friends that are former military, and they love their guns. They have many kinds of guns. I myself have fired the AR-15 many times. Uh, it, it's a, a very versatile gun. People don't just use it for shooting very rapidly. It's also a very excellent long-distance uh, type of gun. I guess... I'm in favor, and this is the thing that sticks out to me, uh, the, the members of the NRA, as well as the general public, 
the membership of the NRA are so in favor of of much more restrictive background checks, uh, much more restrictive waiting periods. Uh, I myself have no problem with whatever kind of ammunition. I think the ammunition ought to be taxed very heavily so you can't buy as much of it. Uh, the uh, magazines and clips, sadly, are so easy to manufacture yourself, but I think those ought to be uh, uh, restricted. I just, I have a problem uh, because a lot of people want to turn the Second Amendment talk into target shooting and hunting. And and if if they want to, that's fine. But the reason it's in the Constitution had more to do at the time with the government having more and better weapons than the populace. In other words, a matter of oppression. Now, I don't hold that view myself, but I know there's a lot of Americans that do. And so I'm I guess with you that that there's got to be some sort of balance. Now I mentioned that my brother, who is former military and is now in law enforcement, is a gun owner in. In the state of Utah, which is one of the least, if not the least restrictive state, and he has a variety of guns, many different types of guns. As far as it concerns the gun culture, why do you think that people that enjoy shooting guns, even uh, the the shooter's mother in the Newton situation, have so many kinds of guns. I mean, why is it not enough just to have one or two guns? Why do they have to have five, seven, ten guns? Well, and I think that's an interesting question that you bring up. And and at some level, I have to say, I, it's not, is it any different than collecting anything? Some people collect golf clubs. Some people collect China teacups. I think what makes the gun ownership issue so complicated is that you can kill people with it. And so then you start to look at what is the what are the rights of the individual versus the rights of the whole. And last week I was actually in Hugo, Minnesota, presenting an award to Hugo for all the work they've done to support their transitioning military. And so on Saturday, I went on their annual veteran pheasant hunt, and I learned a lot about the role of hunting within Minnesota culture. And most of the people that were on this hunt were uh, probably, I would guess, in their late 20s to 40, say 25 to 40. They were members of the Minnesota National Guard. And this was part of the culture of rural Minnesota. When you had kids and they got older, you taught them how to shoot. You went to the range. You shot the clay pigeons. If they got older and they were interested, you took them hunting with you. And so it's it's a in a way it's a hobby i think it's a hobby unlike other hobbies that actually have the potential to kill people mm -hmm. and i think that's where it gets complicated i guess because i don't own guns i can't speak really effectively to what the um, what the attraction of having lots of guns is beyond that it's an interest like any other interest. And actually my sister's wife is an avid gun person in Virginia and she has a number of guns and she likes to go on shooting weekends with other women. And I don't understand it, but she really seems to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm having also, and this is just the way my mind works and, you know, listeners to the program won't be surprised that I have a, a bizarre take on this, but to me, one of the things that's getting overlooked here is the sanctity of human life. And I know, and I know that that might sound strange, but people don't have a problem, or at least seem to have less of a problem with the fact that guns, and, and believe me, I, I don't want one gun to kill one person, but guns kill fewer people than so many other things in our society. I believe that there is a, a a cultural or a social viewpoint that when someone is killed with a gun, uh, unless they are doing a bad thing, that that is unfair and not right and unjust, and it is somehow a a worse loss of life than the people who at a much higher rate die in automobiles every every day, every weekend, uh, and a variety of other things. I mean, we could get into tobacco or cigarettes. Um, the gun culture itself and the, and the, the, our, the way our society looks at the gun violence, do you think there's anything about our society that's now looking at this in a way that is different than they look at other kinds of loss of life? I think that's an excellent point because death by, by gun is very dramatic. It's, it's, 
the analogy is perhaps when we have plane crashes. It's a very sudden loss of life that happens in a dramatic way, and it's very indiscriminate. Whereas someone that dies of cancer, often it's a longer death. So far more people die of cancer than die by gunshot, but the gunshot is very dramatic. And I think that when you look back to the history of the United States, early on in our country's history, we did rely on guns. And when you look at the for lack of a better word, the purpose behind the Second Amendment, it was to make sure that the citizens had the right to arm themselves, that they couldn't be overwhelmed again by a government or by a foreign government. And we very much depended on weapons for hunting, for safety. When you lived out on the prairie, a hundred miles from the nearest neighbor, you were on your own and you had to take care of yourself against animals, robbers, Indians, whatever it would have been 100, 150 years ago. And now society has dramatically changed. But I think that's still in our our cultural heritage and the values that are really ingrained in us is the importance of weapons. And then when those weapons are turned around and used to kill people we love or used to kill children, it's almost like a violation of that cultural ethos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, your experience is largely with or you have a not largely with anything, your experience, Gretchen, in so many ways uh, on this subject. But one of your your focuses is returning veterans. Uh, Are there any warning signs for gun violence? And if so, what are they and how can they be addressed? Well, I think when you look at the history of the certainly the school shootings, but also the, the mass murders by by gun in general, many of these young men gave ample warning that something was terribly, terribly wrong. So they would talk about having run-ins with the police. They will talk about, well, you know, if I'm here next week, they may talk about friends dying. And I think there was a time maybe a decade ago that we didn't really know, we didn't take those things seriously because we hadn't had quite the same history and regularity of mass murder by gun and certainly not on school and college campuses. I think at this point, there's a real hesitancy among people to to know what to do when a friend starts to talk that way. You don't, you don't want to betray them. And because of the laws surrounding... Uh, basically right to privacy, uh, right to action, it's very difficult for the people who see those warning signs to be able to take effective action. So I live in Springfield, Virginia, which is about four or five hours from Virginia Tech, and there were very, very clear-cut signs that the Virginia Tech shooter was extremely troubled and that he was thinking about acts of violence, but the school community had no legal recourse to get him help or to call his parents and say, I think something is terribly wrong with your son. So I think that there, there are issues around veterans, but, but I wanted to start with the more generalizable signs that we see across the board in these shooters who commit these, these gun acts. Mm-hmm. You know, if you uh, watch Turner classic movies as often as I do, It seems like back in the 30s and 40s, it was a relatively easy thing to get someone committed. I mean, three or four people got together, signed a piece of paper and said, we're noticing some behavior here. There's something going wrong. And guys in white suits came in with with a straight jacket. And and it's obviously much, much, much different now Um, as it concerns the current topic. uh, President Obama has just sworn that by January there's going to be some sort of uh, of an agenda regarding steps to take on a path to get these shootings to end. Are you of the school of thought that a little time needs to pass for the emotion and the uh, vitriol to die down on this topic? Or are you of the school of thought that says, no, right now, more people than not are interested in making this stop. So we do need to discuss it immediately right now. I actually think that we do need to discuss it right now. I remember after the Columbine shootings thinking, this is finally going to push America to looking at how we can take sensible action to try to prevent more of these massacres, and yet it never happened. And every time we had the Virginia Tech shooting, we had the shooting in the movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, and every time we say, oh, we really need to take this on, 
but the time passes and then it never, we never have the conversation. So I don't think that we should rush into action, but I think that we should start an intelligent dialogue with, with multiple uh, perspectives represented. So I think we need the gun control advocates, but we also need the people who believe in the right to bear arms and to try to find some happy compromises that both keep individual people safe and, and respect the needs of the greater good and also respect the needs of the individual gun owner. And I think that many people have strongly held opinions, but I I followed this really closely just because it, it, it started to generate a national dialogue. And I'm not personally seeing what I would label a lot of vitriol. There are a lot of strongly held opinions, but I also get an undercurrent. And it kind of started with Bob Costas' comment right before the, the Connecticut shootings of let's start a national dialogue. Let's see where we can find common ground and actually try to start working on some solutions. Yeah, I think the vitriol is largely in the media, uh, and I'm referring specifically to uh, not just one side of the coin, but I've seen, if you watch the Fox News channel, they're obviously very pro-gun mm -hmm. ownership, and if you watch Piers Morgan, he wants every gun in the country melted down and, and put away and, and had, uh, you know, 10 of the Aurora victims on to talk about the subject, who... I mean, obviously have tragic stories to tell, but aren't likely to be particularly unbiased on the issue. Uh, I heard a gentleman, uh, uh, I mean, I believe his name is Jeffrey Tubin. He was talking about the fact, and I think this is true, that the NRA is going to be here in six months when people start to, you know, live their lives and forget about the issue and how terrible all of us feel right now. And that's kind of their their uh, keynote to success is that they're always going to be there with their agenda and everyone else kind of dissipates. There is no real one organization or voice for the gun control uh, side of things. So I, I personally, I think in the past would have been right at the front of the crowd of people saying, I think we need to wait on this. I, I'm kind of right now saying, no, uh, this is the time to discuss it right now. And why don't we get, get some, uh, of the steps put in place that you mentioned? Because I don't think it's, it's one facet of an issue. I think it's many different facets, but I think, I think we need to start today. Now, this is a little part of, of these facets. As it affects our culture in general, do you do you think these hyper stylized and violent gun shooter games affect the culture of the young men that are doing this, or at least the desensitization of, of people in general regarding guns and shooting? I would say yes to both. I think when you look at so I'm fifty years old and I remember when I was I think 12 and the movie Towering Inferno came out. I don't know how many of your viewers are old enough to remember that. I was not allowed to watch that at age 12 because my mother thought that that was far too violent for me to be exposed to at age 12. And if you look at the things that were considered very edgy 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it doesn't begin to compare to what's out there now and the slasher movies like The Saw and all these these very violent movies as well as the shooter games. And, and what's alarming when it comes to the video games, it's funny, I have a 20-year-old son and we would get into disagreements over whether or not he was allowed to play the right rated M shooter games. And I would say, well, you know, you're 12, you're 13. I just don't think you need to play these kind of games and he would come back at me and say mom it's not like i'm going to play this game and then go shoot somebody but i think the video games that we're seeing now on the market are actually many of them are actually used by our military to desensitize soldiers to killing and there's a time i've seen studies that say that during uh world war ii and that that people would not really aim to kill and that the actual, I don't know what you call it, like a hit rate was only about 40%. And the military realized that there's a very, very strong aversion to killing. It's a very human thing. And so they started training soldiers in a different way. And by Vietnam, the, the effective shooting rate was more like about 90%. And today's military, as I understand it, really uses a lot of video games to help to, to, 
program or deprogram, as you prefer to look at it, people to really be able to shoot at the enemy and hit them. And now many of those games are available on the market. And so I think this has all kind of come together to really desensitize us as a population in general, and maybe particularly those young white men, because I know my daughter, who's 24, has never really played video games. My son is a pretty avid video game player. So I think that that's another piece to the puzzle. It's not just gun control. It's not just how we deal with mentally ill people. It's also looking at movies and video games and rap music, all that that sensationalized violence, particularly gun violence. Well, in some of those games, it's not just about the shooting. It's about knowing how to create the stealth to get around the corner to set the guy up to shoot him and, mm -hmm. and all the rest of the little uh, cunning tricks uh, that those games teach. I love those games. I, I mean, I, I, I really like them. The thing that bothers me, and I've, I've mentioned this to you before, is I have nephews that don't want to play this for an hour or four hours or five hours. They want to do it every single waking second of the day. If they have a weekend with nothing to do, they'll get a jug of Mountain Dew and strap themselves mm -hmm. to their little game chair and they don't leave it. Now to another topic, um, First of all, I'm very close to you in age, and I would say that you really are lucky that you didn't go to the Towering Inferno because you can watch it now, <laughs> and it was in sense around, which meant that they just turned the speakers up super loud in the theater to give you the sensation that uh, that you were being, you know, bombarded and jarred. But uh, if you were very, very lucky, you did not go see Earthquake, um, which which followed the Towering Inferno. Um there are parallels uh, between the, the latest acts of gun violence and the returning veteran, you know, young men, uh, the post-traumatic stress disorder, things of that nature to deal with that create issues uh, as well as difficulty finding a job and things of being disenfranchised, feelings of no real future. How do those type of feelings contribute to the issue, perhaps in, in the case of the recent shooter and uh, shooters in general? Well, I think it absolutely plays a part. And when you look at, and again, I, I want to be cautious and respectful because we don't really have the whole story and we, we may very well never have the whole story about what happened with the Connecticut shooter. But what information is out there, if we can assume that it's correct, shows that here was a young man who did feel very isolated. He didn't feel like he fit in. It sounds like maybe there were some some ways that he was, if not bullied, at least teased, that he may have had mental health problems. He may have, um, I don't want to blame this in the autism community, has come out very strongly. Well, we don't need against, to use that example. We could use the but, example, say, of Columbine. Where yeah, any of those, where, where there's a sense of disenfranchisement. And I think that's a piece of, if you have become so detached from society, then it's easier to kill. If those young men, this shooting or any of those shootings, were really able to connect with the people that they shot as people, they never would have been able to pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot here uh, very badly. I'm going to apologize okay. in, in, in advance. Say that you are talking to someone that is extremely in favor of uh, gun control. They don't feel like there is any reason for any civilian to have any firearm whatsoever. In other words, say you're talking to Piers Morgan on CNN. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say to that person about this issue? Well, I would say that like, as with any issue... There has to be balance. There are, I, I have known people that hunt for food. I know people that live in rural communities where they're far enough away from civilization, for lack of a better word, uh, fire, police, sheriffs, that they have the, they feel they have the need to own weapons to keep themselves safe. Having just been in Minnesota, I really got, even as someone who doesn't own guns, as someone who's not a hunter, I got the importance of hunting to families in Minnesota. In my community, people might golf or they might play tennis. In Minnesota, they go hunting. And so I would 
try to help them understand that it's not simply about that, that guns are a part of our culture and they're a part of our culture in both good and bad ways. The, the whole glorification of gun violence is not at all healthy. What I actually saw in Minnesota was frankly a very healthy gun culture. There was a an extreme focus on safety. They actually, before all of the, now you have to remember, these are National Guard soldiers. They came back less than a year ago from Afghanistan where they were in combat. And they said, these are the rules. And one of the rules was if anyone pulls out a cell phone, they immediately stop hunting and everyone has to to, um, unload their weapons. Because if we're gonna be out hunting, we need to be 100% focused on the hunt. So I think that there are appropriate places for weapons, for um, the gun culture, and it's finding that right balance. So as much as I personally choose in my own life not to own guns, I would try to help the Piers Morgans of the world to understand that there is a different perspective, and that perspective is equally valid. And that's why I think it's so important that we start this dialogue, because I think it's going to take us a while to find that happy medium. It keeps people safe. It respects rights to privacy and addresses the the issue of massacres that occur two or three times a year, it seems. Yeah. Piers Morgan wants a lifetime supply of 50 bullets, uh, which I think is a little excessive. And I, I too, have been in communities, uh, as I mentioned, my brother out in Utah, 2,500 square miles, 2,400 people. Every year they have the hunt. It's a, a regularly scheduled time of year with a certain number of elk and deer. And mm-hmm. there are many freezers filled with elk meat and deer meat that these people, it's not just a novelty. They, it's, that's part of their diet. Now, what would you say to the most chest beating Lyndon LaRue? Rouge, NRA, uh, I should be able to have a tank or a nuclear weapon uh, pro-gun person. Well, I would actually bring bring out the point that civilians are not allowed to drive Abram tanks around their communities. You're actually not allowed to have grenade launchers. And there are many things that are regulated when you've ha- been caught driving drunk multiple times, they will take away your driver's license because you're a danger to society. And I think as much as I do believe that people have the right to own guns, I also have a right to go to the movies and not worry that I'm going to be shot. I have a right for my children to go to the movies and not worry if they're going to come back alive because some crazy person with a concealed weapon is going to whip out a gun and shoot them. So I think that we have to find that happy medium. And the reality is that there are people who are mentally unbalanced. And I would press them to give me a logical argument to allow mentally ill people to have access to guns. Because I can't think of any reason that that mentally ill people should have guns. I I I am right with you there. I think that could be another one of the restrictions that you place on it. I think it would be very difficult to enforce, but I think d- trying to would be better than not. The truth of the matter, if you look at it statistically, with the three hundred million guns in the country, is that the legal law abiding gun owner is microscopic in terms of gun violence. It's it's it is such a statistical anomaly. It almost doesn't exist. It's the people that have gotten guns, be they legal or illegal, uh, a different way and 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 taken them somewhere. And this is, I guess, the crux of my question. What can we do to defend in a free society areas where there are large numbers of defenseless people like a school, like a mall? Um, let's face it, a handgun was the was the weapon of choice at Fort Hood. And that particular handgun pistol is 20 times the the herstal is 20 times more lethal than the uh AR15 that was used in Newtown how can we defend or how how can we make more safe uh areas like schools malls grocery stores where there are large numbers of defenseless people well i think the malls and the grocery stores are probably a little harder because there are so many access points and so many people in and out. I, and, and you can't really regulate who has the right to be in a grocery store or to be in a shopping mall. But I think with schools and many schools have have moved this way. I know they have in, in my own 
community in Fairfax County that the older schools as they're being renovated, the offices are moved so that the offices have glass windows that face the front doors. Many schools are installing buzzer systems so that there's controlled access to who gets in. They have cameras so that they can see who's who's standing at the door and they're not just buzzing anybody in. It, but I think there's also a sad reality that when you look at the Newtown shooting, that young man was very determined. My understanding, if the media reports are correct, he broke into the school. He broke the glass to get in. And there's a certain place where we're never going to be able to completely prevent this. But I think it's it gets to access. If I'm if I'm a crazy person, I'm thinking, hey, maybe I'm going to go shoot up my local elementary school and I don't have easy access to guns. If I'm not if I'm only thinking about it and, and the guns are there, maybe I'll go and do it. But if they're going to make it hard for me to get access to the guns, if they're going to make it hard for me to get into the school, that may be enough of a deterrent that I just give up because I wasn't really that committed. Unfortunately, the reality is someone who's truly, truly committed to, to committing an act like that, probably nothing is going to stop them mm -hmm. because they're not going to tell people. They're going to find if if my mom doesn't have guns, I'm going to find a way to, to buy them legally. I'll steal them. I'll, I'll find a way. And I think that that's something that we may just have to live with as long as we have, you know, we're not like some of the other developed countries in the world that highly regulate gun ownership. If, we, if we're going to have a second amendment that allows people to be armed, then the reality is that Sometimes crazy people are going to get guns and they're going to do terrible things with them. Well, your point's well taken. The Columbine uh, shooters uh, got their guns illegally through a second party. They went to a, someone of, of age and said, can you go get us these guns? He went to a gun show, got them, provided them. As I understand it, in Newtown, the principal implemented a buzzer system. Mm -hmm. And they had to be buzzed in. They wouldn't buzz him in. So he uh, shot out the windows and went in uh, because you do deal with so many veterans. Uh, you know, if you go to a bank, I've, I haven't been to a bank in ages where there's not some form, especially in a large city mm -hmm. of security. Uh, we guard our money very, very well. Um, what do you think of this notion of we have so many veterans returning that are qualified with handguns, that, that are proficient, that know the rules of safety, that know that you only aim at something you're going to shoot and you know what's behind what you're going to shoot, all the rules of gun safety. They know them all. They've been trained. What do you think of the notion, uh, if we can fight a war over there, why don't we put one of these gentlemen or women in in schools, as a trained person, some people have lobbied for teachers, which I think is a spectacularly bad idea. But putting a qualified person in these schools as a security officer, uh, is that an idea that you would be in favor of? I've actually never heard of that. I do know that some schools now do employ security officers and often they come through the police department. I know my daughter's high school had a full-time security officer, even though nothing had ever happened. He did have a weapon and he had a little office near the front door of the school. So I think that's certainly a viable option. I, I think it's an issue of balance because we don't want our children to be afraid. And I know after September 11th, without going into the whole long story, there was an incident at my kid's elementary school and People went crazy. People, I happened to be the PTA president at the time, and people were calling me saying, you know, we need to do install jersey barriers in front of the elementary school. We needed snipers on the roof. And I would ask people, I said, do you really want to be bringing your children to school with military snipers on the roof? Because that's not the kind of environment that I want my children going to school in. However, a security officer where it's put in a context and children are not be made to be afraid, I think is an interesting idea that the, the glitch I see is that schools are already so, their budgets are already so strained that, that they're increasing class sizes, they're cutting down on all kinds of, you know, music and PE and art. And so the question would be, how would we fund that? When you look mm -hmm. at the Fairfax County where I live has, oh my gosh, I think 150 schools. So that's 150 full-time people that would then need to be employed. But it's a very interesting idea because we do have a serious veteran unemployment issue and many of our young veterans really do want to continue 
a job where they protect and defend. Mm -hmm. That's why they went into the military. I think it would have to be done federally. I don't think it could be done on a local school basis. There's, as you mentioned, school districts out there that are trying just to keep their doors open. They're closing schools. They're, you know, letting teachers go, et cetera. I think it would have to be federally funded. And I, I think it would have to be almost like the air marshal program mm -hmm. that was put into place after 9-11. Um, let's talk about something else. And I, I'm very anxious to hear about this. Let's talk a little about Homeward Deployed, the organization you founded and now run. Well, Homeward Deployed provides transition support to veterans, members of the National Guard and Reserve, as well as military families and wounded warrior caregivers. So we provide free transition coaching through a partnership with the International Coach Federation to work with, with transitioning military and their families for generally about three months, once a week, mainly to help them figure out what's my next step. If I'm looking for a job, maybe I don't know what kind of job I want. Maybe I'm going back to school and I don't know what to major and maybe I want to earn a degree, but I really need a job right now and helping them to figure out plans to get them where they want to go. And then also the wraparound services for the military families, particularly our National Guard through the cycles of deployment and our wounded warrior caregivers, because they're really not anyone's particular priority right now. They don't fall, they're not anyone's prime directive. And then the other piece of, of what we do is working, helping communities to mobilize and figure out how to meet the needs of transitioning military. And I think where this actually intersects with the conversation we're having on, on gun violence and gun ownership is that many, many military, not surprisingly, own guns. And I know many military wives, when their husbands deploy, their husbands will buy them a gun and, and take them to the range a couple of times to, to learn, you know, to practice using the gun. And we also have a real epidemic of military suicide. And the vast majority of those suicides are committed via gun. People shoot themselves. And it probably has to do primarily because most of our military, 90% are men, and men tend to kill themselves by shooting themselves. Whereas a woman will take a bottle of pills and then you can kind of rethink that. You can call 911, you can call a friend, you can pass out and someone finds you. There's often a time lag between taking the pills and actually dying. So I think that excuse me, it kind of brings it full circle of looking at gun violence in the context of our veterans and saying, well, it, it also gun violence, suicide is considered gun violence. And we actually have 18,000 people a year that commit suicide by gun. Um, that's actually more than the 12,000 people a year that are killed in homicides mm -hmm. by guns. So I think that there's another interesting public health, public safety issue of looking at gun violence in the context of suicide prevention, because many of the people that buy guns in states where there is not a waiting period, buy them to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we had a waiting period, they might rethink that. And I, I've really reflected a lot on that when we look at addressing the issue of military suicide. And perhaps it, it comes full circle if we had different gun laws, maybe we wouldn't be losing quite so many service members and veterans to suicide. Yeah, I, I don't know. I've never run into a person in my, my life that has said, I really disagree with a waiting period. I, I, I do not understand why a waiting period is such an unreasonable request. Uh, it, it just seems it seems like that and a background check are not too much to ask. Um, how can people uh, contribute to Homeward Deployed or get more involved with Homeward Deployed? Well, I think, and it's funny because you asked me about Homeward Deployed and I flipped it over into veteran suicide, which I've been thinking a lot about. Uh, but uh, we have a website, www.homewarddeployed.org, and you may have listeners that are active duty service members, veterans, members of the National Guard and Reserve, military families, and our services are free to all military and their families. So you can also call 1-855-VET-COACH um, 
and generally within 24 hours someone will be in touch with you and figure out what you what you need what you want and match you up with a coach if you decide that that's a good fit for you so um, I'm glad that you asked that because we always do this is really how we're most effective in getting the word out about our services is really through through media through grassroots strategies letting people know that we're here we're here to support you you have done enough for our country and it's our turn to give back and and to support you okay well you know i i you know i'm just doing my part you've been kind enough to come onto the program that's what i do is i you know give you a little plug and one more plug here because this is something else that's intriguing me is my final question is the title of your book if you want to talk about your book a little bit is untying the yellow ribbon why saving sorry why saying thank you for your service isn't enough uh can you talk about that and tell us why isn't saying thank you for your service enough and what in general is the book about well the book is about how communities can and need to mobilize to support this generation of veterans. And it, it comes, the reason I wrote the book is after having done this work for seven years now, I keep getting the same questions. And one of the big questions is, well, we don't hate people like we did after Vietnam. So why aren't they transitioning well? And there are a lot of answers to that. But one of the concerns I have is because we don't hate our veterans the way that we did after Vietnam. We're able to separate the warrior from the war. What I hear a lot is people saying, well, I always tell them, thank you for your service. Or, you know, I go to the parade or, you know, I have a yellow ribbon in my front yard. And those are all lovely gestures. But this generation of veterans is going to need more than that if they're going to transition well. And really, our federal systems are not keeping pace with meeting their needs. So if America doesn't want to lose another generation of veterans, then it's going to be up to our communities because we're the only safety net left that's nimble enough to really react and create programs or not even create programs but provide the safety net and that's actually why I was in Hugo Minnesota last week in Wyman Tyler Texas today is is awarding those communities sea of goodwill awards for the efforts that they have taken on without any government funding without a congressional mandate to support the veterans in their community so that's that's the metaphor of why saying thank you for your service isn't enough if America doesn't want to lose another generation of veterans Veterans, then communities need to mobilize. And I recognize that the economy is terrible, that mayors and city councils and city managers have a lot on their plate already. But this is a group of very young people, 80% of our transitioning military are under 30 with a high school education, and they have so much promise and so much potential. And they just need support for a few years to make that transition well. And the flip side, if we don't help them transition, it's been 40 years since we pulled out of Vietnam. And every single year, the long-term care cost for our Vietnam era veterans goes up. And this generation is much bigger. They're much more impacted by both the, the physical wounds of war as well as the invisible wounds of war. So that's that's the work I do. Thank you for asking. I appreciate that. Less about plugging the book than, than getting the word out and getting communities to really think about what they can do and and actually the benefit to community, what I've seen in the communities that I've studied and work with, they actually are strengthening the fabric of their communities in rallying to support their veterans. And it's a really beautiful thing to see in those communities. Well, Gretchen, I feel bad because I did not tell you uh, that you should pronounce it Tyler. You oh. can say you can say it Tyler, but Tyler is... Tyler. Yeah, that's... you know this is terrible, Tom. Because here I've been here for a day and a half, looking like a, a northern fool. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. They won't mind. <laughs> Teasing. Uh, and uh, another thing is, not only are you perhaps the most articulate guest I've ever had, your radio voice, your speaking voice, is so much better than mine that I I have to tell you I don't know that you'll ever be back on the program. Uh, I find that very hard to believe because you have a great radio voice. Yeah, right. Well, I thank you so much for, for coming on the program and uh, leaping over all the technological hurdles and being with us. It was a true pleasure to speak to you. And anytime we can do something for you or for Homeward Deployed, uh, do not hesitate to let us know.
Thank you, Tom. I very much enjoyed being on the show and you gave me a lot to think about. If I only had one word to describe this new series, it would be excitement. The drama will be about people caught up in a critical moment of life and death and presented as realistically and creatively as possible. We're tremendously excited about it. We think you will be, too. You're listening to The Tom Gully Show. Big thanks to tonight's guest, Gretchen Martins, and please take the time to visit Homeward Deployed and help her fine organization with time, money, or anything else you have on. Folks, we'd really appreciate it if you'd share this on your various Facebook pages. Trying to spread the word means trying to spread our little show here. We'd appreciate it also if you'd like the Tom Gully Show, not me, but the show on Facebook, too, if the mood strikes you. Also, you can follow me on Twitter at Atomic Palooka, and I would appreciate it if you would do that. There are 16 color boxes of Crayola crayons that have more followers than me. That'll do it for tonight. I'm out of here. I got to go talk to some people. I'll talk to you fine folks much later. We'll take you out as always with Catch 22 Blues by the Hitman Blues Band, and we will see you next time. Well, the bucket lifts a twig for a dog to snuff a big, but he don't want to. And the dog can't grab a cat, a raccoon can do all that, but he don't want to. And I dream of you at night while you hold your baby tight, but he don't want you.